Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending Griffin's Cannabis Online Workshop. Uh, before we begin, just a word of thanks to our sponsors. They've helped make this the educational series that it's become. That would be 10X, Verano 365, DPH Biologicals, Grodan, and Promix. Thank you again to the sponsors. Today is part of one part of our five-part series that connects with improving efficiency and profitability in cannabis cultivation. Our goal for today's webinar and the entire series is that you learn about innovations and strategies that you can implement immediately or in the near term that can move the needle forward for you and your team. Today, we have two presenters for you. The first is Elwood Roberts, a Griffin GGS Pro Technical Specialist He'll be presenting on efficient crop scouting techniques. The second presentation is by Jeff Coco. He's with BioLine AgroSciences as the IPM technical specialist. He'll show us how to reduce labor tied to BCA use. I'm sure you'll find both presentations to be very informative. As an attendee, you'll receive a link to the recording of this webinar. Feel free to ask questions and enter them into the chat during the presentation. In order to make this a more interactive experience, we'll ask your questions during the presentation in real time as time allows. With that, Elward, the screen is yours. Thank you. So I'm a member of GGS Pro, Griffin's technical team, and we're here to answer your questions, everything from fertilizer programs, crop culture, chemical rates and usage, um, I'm going to repeat this contact information at the end of the presentation as well, but you can find it easily on the Griffin website. So uh, feel free to give us a call because we're here to help. So why scouting? Um, there's some specific demands in our crop. Uh, there's few corrective sprays available, especially in some states. Integrated pest management is common practice. Uh, we use biocontrol agents or BCAs uh, commonly. And we also use a lot of biopesticides, biofungicides, all of which are better used as preventative measures than curative measures. So it pays to be on top, especially in such a high value crop. And then in my experience also, we have two kinds of growers, those that baby the plants, and those that stress the plants. I think the idea is that stressing the crop may increase terpene levels, but if you're that cat, stressed plants are more vulnerable to pest and disease, so you have to be more cautious and get ahead of the curve. When do we scout? Well, scouting is maintenance. It's like washing your car. If you do it regularly, it'll take less time and be more effective. If you only clean your car twice a year, it's going to take a long time to do. And most of the time, you're going to be driving around in a dirty car. If you try to do it every day, that may not be a good return on investment. Even though it doesn't take very long, the time adds up. Weekly is considered the standard for scouting, and it works very well in this particular crop. Although I will say there's certain events in the crop cycle that require a little extra attention. Transplanting, transition of flower, and deleafing all stress the crop. <clears throat> so they also can serve as an opportunity for uh, a little bit more efficient scouting. Uh, you imagine there's less foliage, it's easier to find your problems, and it's also easier to make spray applications. So, you know, there's some small efficiencies built into the crop. Who scouts? Same person, same day. Scouts have to be observant, capable of a high level of attention to detail. Uh, in my experience, I'm often not the best scout in the world. Scouting is a calm. It's uh, passion and interest are really more important than experience when you're looking for a new group from your group to turn into an ITM scout. Just the same, you should train everyone. The more eyes there are on the crop, the better the results are going to be. Uh, 
create a culture that responds to the natural curiosity that people have about your product. Use marking tape to record and report potential mm -hmm. issues. Like everybody that has a cart should have a piece of tape on there where they can mark a problem and report it to the IPM team and then find it again easily. And I'll say it again and again, communication is key here. You've got a lot of folks. Make sure you use their natural curiosity. What are we looking for? Well, of course, insects. But when we start reporting our, our scouting, we want to uh, include all the important life stages. So if you can see eggs, report them separately from the larvae and the adults. In terms of pathogens, just be able to recognize when a plant's sick and when it's healthy. Uh, know when it's sick and tag it or bag it. Nutritional abiotic symptoms can look very similar to uh, disease or insect damage. But what you need to do in cases where you don't find something specific, you want good communication again between your IPM team and the cultivation managers. We also have a technical reference guide that the entire chapter seven is a really good general resource for scouting. Good photographs of, and, and, and lists of damages and, and what you can expect to see when you're out there scouting. Where do we scout? Don't forget to scout the mother plants. I know that should be obvious, but it's your first uh, stage and you really do need to look at it carefully. Um, I also really recommend scouting my strain. I think it may be the most important thing I say to you. Um, some strains are just a better host or more attracted to certain pests. Uh, they may be more difficult to spray because of their particular physiological characteristics. And uh, I have come to believe that you know, BCAs hunt some strains better than others. So if you keep a record of that, sooner or later, it's going to become an advantage to you. Um, you don't have to scout randomly. Scout, scout the most vulnerable areas. Uh, doors, airflow tubes seem to carry things that have wings. Uh, dead corners where you might have uh, some sort of pathogen earlier than other places in the room where there's better air. Uh, under benches, weeds, and drains, uh, I've seen a number of places where uh, fungus gnat and shore fly larva breed quite readily, but nobody's treating it because it's out of the way. Biosecurity goes hand in hand in scouting, so I, I feel like I really do have to mention uh, when you bring new material, having a quarantine area and scouting carefully before it enters the crop is super important. And then I like to call it, uh, you know, the little strategy, just red, yellow, and green. If you have multiple spaces, it's okay to go from yellow to red, but not yellow to green without protecting the crop with use of protective suits or scrubs, you know, some type of protocol. And it's best to schedule work crews according that they're moving from the cleanest rooms to the dirtiest rooms by the way. Sticky traps. Um, you want to have, I think, the yellow ones in the crop. So if you understand that something like a thrips is looking for pollen and you're in a room full of green, they're going to see that yellow as an opportunity to get plant protein to fly to. You also need hand lenses. Uh, 15X it was always this standard. There's a lot of inexpensive 30X out there on the internet now. But because of rust mite and broad mite, it's also important to have something with a 60X or 90X to be able to see some of those. A set of small pruners so you can clip materials and then put them in a Ziploc bag so you're not moving it around inside the crop with something that's potentially uh, you could spread it. And then a waterproof marker and flagging tape so you know where you got it and you know where you can go back to to show some of the 
that's the problem. Uh, beat sheet and uh, clipboard and tablet are often for me the same thing. Uh, an iPad makes a really good beach sheet where you can just shake the plant over the tablet and it's really easy to clean up with alcohol afterwards. When I go from place to place on visits, I'm very cautious to clean all of my uh, materials before I go into another establishment. So. And then technique. So the standard is uh, one monitoring card for every thousand square feet, more or less the same place. And you're counting the same one every week so you can mon uh, you know, monitor changes. So uh, you could do more cards, you know, again, a thousand square foot's a minimum, but remember that too many is not labor efficient. Someone has to count them or they're only traps. Traps are a good idea and you can have them around, but count the same cards every week. The other 10 leaves per thousand square feet uh, doesn't sound like a lot. If you're examining 10 plants and collecting leaves from, from those same 10 plants, but that's going to be 40 leaves in a 4,000 square foot room. Or perhaps if you had, say, seven strains, you might get six leaves per strain or something along those lines. But keep it consistent. It's the weekly repetition that's what's going to give you a program of real strength. Dedicated space for your IPM crew is so beneficial in this crop. Um, cannabis is grown in harsh conditions, frequently in some difficult lighting, uh, some tiered veg spaces, and our prey image is very small. What we're looking for is hard to find in, in, in difficult lighting. So if you have a dedicated space with more sophisticated magnifiers, a computer, perhaps, so you can start entering your data right away. Um, some of the idea uh, testing kits, uh, a, a small lab space mixed with your IPM space is, is pretty well ideal. Um, but better lighting tools and environment contribute to efficiency. It's as simple as that. Spreadsheets are a great way to record that information and as you're going forward you can see those long-term trends it becomes valuable in a really relative short period of time once you're a year into it you really start seeing the trends happen if you can also uh, understand what strain you were looking at uh, uh, what room it was in even what table it was on and include some abiotic data uh, in terms of you know, sometimes you see a problem in the count, but then you go back and you say, well, we had a breakdown in some equipment right before that, or we had a chemical correction that didn't work, or that did work particularly well, or what your release schedule was for BCAs that either worked or didn't work in the last time. You will see value over time, and that will help you develop those actionable thresholds. Uh, Excuse me, Ellen. Mm -hmm. Can we just have you speak a little louder? It's a little bit choppy. Maybe if you speak just a little bit louder. Okay, do what I okay. can. Thank you. So, if you can develop actionable thresholds, um, so when you're comfortable moving from a preventative to a curative rate of BCAs, um, whether or not uh, you're going to do a mechanical deleafing in order to take some of the bad guys off of the plant, or whether it's time to do a chemical correction or two. Um, these are all things that can help, you can help make that decision if you have a spreadsheet pointing you in the way. And with that in mind, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make up a story here, essentially using data. Um, as simple as we can make it, just to uh, illustrate something. So, um, this is fictitious data, but it really does uh, speak to a true story and something I've seen in a, a number of different operations. So Western flower thrips is really difficult to eradicate, but it's pretty easy to manage if you're disciplined. 
Uh, I've gone in places where it's otherwise really well managed, but there's a six, week six, week seven of flower. There's outbreak and plant damage right at the time where you can't really spray for it because you're getting ready for harvest. And what we're going to do is uh, show you a way you could use some data to look for gaps in coverage and then uh, decide how you're going to treat it. So some people are blessed with the gift of, of being able to pick numbers out of columns and see trends. I'm, I'm less that way. I'm a little more visual. But you can see here average thrips per card. Your monitoring card is going to be winged insects, so it's going to be adults. There's high numbers right at the point where we would expect them. But there's also a, a surge week two of flower and week three of flower. So if we look at that, and, and my preferred way of seeing something like this would be in a graph. And this is, again, simplest graph you can make. But you can see uh, that the population of larva on the leaf explodes in weeks one through three. But the number of adults on the cards don't come in until a little bit later. And we see those populations doubled up in weeks four, five, and six. So we're going to add another column. And I'm going to call this the event timeline. What happened in that room to cause that gap in coverage? And we see where in the first three weeks, uh, they have moms in with the bedroom. Uh, it's not ideal, but I see it in a lot of places. So there's always a small population of thrips that they're managing with BCAs. But in week four, as they go into the transition to flower, they didn't get BCAs on it because of the movement. And then in week one, they decided to do a 25B application which would be, you know, perhaps a responsible way of trying to start cleaning flour. Um, the problem with something like that is the 25B product is a wide spectrum killer. It may suppress the white flower thrips larva, but also it killed the BCAs, leaving no protection for a single generation. And because the thrips eggs are buried in the tissue, they'd hatch out in about four days. Now, uh, a thrips will go from an egg to an egg layer in about 15 to 20 days. And a female thrips can lay 200 eggs. Um, that would mean that you could have potentially for uh, every female that was alive in that room, you could see the potential for 200 thrips in outbreak. Now, the mites only attack the first thin star thrips. So by the time the sachets come in week two, or even deleafing in week three, where it's trying to remove some material, you already have a full generation that's loose and perhaps overwhelming the DCAs that are there in the flower. So that's what this would look like. Going back to the graph again, we can see where the, the adults uh, got ahead of the curve and ahead of the protective, preventative uh, rates they were applying flower. So how are we going to get that larva under control and fill that one week gap in protection? Uh, my choice for this, uh, I really think that a cucumerous sachet on a stick in uh, week four veg is an economical way to ensure that the BCAs are moving from one place, you know, one room to the next. Um, there are also a number of compatible spray corrections. If you were to call us at uh, GGS Pro, uh, we can we keep a compatibility list and we can help you uh, choose chemicals for your state that are appropriate for your target. And then when it has to be a 25B because that's all available, the, all that's available to you. Uh, tie your sprays uh, carefully for uh, to make sure the BCAs aren't suppressed by the you know by your spraying. So you can see where that you know has the potential of helping you. Uh, and if we put it all together, and, and so where are the efficiencies? Anticipation is always more efficient than reaction. So if you establish a routine, 
develop a approach uh, and one that you can execute and become comfortable with, you get ahead of the game. And it's easier to manage problems. Than you can also avoid a lot of test problems by, like we said, uh, making sure that you have a decent quarantine space and you don't bring anything new to the um, Biosecurity is, kind of goes hand in hand with Scott. Um, invest in tools, space, and people. Uh, to get a return on investment, you have to invest. Track your progress, uh, issues and results. And uh, over time, that's going to be valuable. And then, uh, Again, communication is key. Make sure that all the players are involved. And I'd be happy to take some, some questions if you don't. I don't see any questions open at this time. Uh, if anybody would like to go ahead and type them in, please do. Okay, it looks like we're we're clear on questions. Uh, thanks very much, Elwood. We appreciate that. That was very informative. Thanks for the uh, concise presentation. Uh, now, just in time, <laughs> we've got Jeff Coco, who was uh, on the road today. So we appreciate you uh, landing and and getting on the call. Thanks a million, Jeff. So as as I mentioned before. Jeff is a BioLine AgroSciences IPM tech specialist, and he is going to review how to reduce labor tied to BCS use. So, uh, Jeff, you want to go ahead and share your screen and, and keep, sure keep this rolling. Thank you, sir. Can you guys hear me all right? I can hear you perfect. Yes, thank you. All right. Let me make sure uh, I am. Uh... Mm -hmm. Let me make sure I'm in presentation mode. There we go. I'll have to do that after. All right. All right. Are we seeing everything okay? Yeah, perfect, Jeff. All right. Well, yeah, so I'm glad I uh, made it when I did. It was a uh, arduous journey this morning, but I'm glad to be here. Um, Thank you all for being patient for me to get situated here. And uh, thank you to Griffin for hosting this awesome event. Hopefully you guys have gotten a lot of good information already today. Uh, before I dive into my presentation, I wanted to give a little bit of a background upon me. As Mike mentioned, I'm uh, uh, IPM technical specialist for BioLine AgroSciences. Uh, I have a master's degree in entomology with a specific focus on integrated pest management. Um, I really enjoy plant insect interaction, so I kind of get nerdy on this stuff. So bear with me on that. Um, prior to this role, I um, I worked for an MSO in Florida, and I oversaw an IPM program at two facilities. One was a seven-acre greenhouse uh, with absolutely no biosecurity, and then I had an indoor facility, a smaller in indoor facility, much better with biosecurity. Um, so a couple totally different scenarios in which um, to apply my skill set uh, and work with my team. And, uh, you know, now I find myself on the other side of it. So I feel like I'm in a perfect position to talk a little bit about how uh, how we may be able to reduce labor with, uh, with uh, biocontrol agent usage. Um, with that, I'm going to dive right in here. So the first thing I want to mention is, uh, you know, focusing on identifying your needs and where you where you may think you need your biological control agents. Uh, obviously, focusing on prevention is uh, the first and foremost thing we should always think about. I'm sure there's many of us that have been in a situation where we've um, tried to con uh, control an outbreak and you spend a lot of time and money and you might not get exactly the results that you need. So focusing on prevention um, and part of that entails, obviously, understanding the insects that are going to be attacking your crops. So keep those things in mind. Uh, also, part of those needs, you want to look at whether or not you have an indoor and outdoor facility, because both uh, might have different uh, biosecurity scenarios going on. Um, I know in my experience, 
our outdoor greenhouse scenario had absolutely no biosecurity. So that was a completely different monster than managing the indoor facility. Um, other things you want to look at is the growth stages of your plants. Uh, you know, some growers uh, incorporate mom and prop in the same areas, and in some cases even veg. Um, other growers keep their things very much separated, so they might have different application uh, scenarios for um, each growing area. And of course, flower is going to be different than veg. Um, n never mind, you know, your your temperature and your light requirements and things like that. But uh, just in terms of what you can introduce in the crop at those times. Before I get into uh, some of the, the newer, maybe newer to some people, maybe not uh, so new, but uh, I'm going to talk about some of the standard release methods that we have out there and available at this moment. Um, you may be familiar with the sachet breeding systems, which are is going to be predatory mites. Um, you're going to have predatory mites in there as well as some feeder mites, a little bit of uh, carrier material, um, and these are designed specifically for the mites to feed and breed in there and then slowly release a population over time over your crop. Um, these are really good for a uh, preventative method to introduce the biologicals before you have anything uh, show up in your crop. A um, couple different formats available, the ones that you can hang on your crop and the other ones on a stick. Again, so this would apply to um, the different stages or, or the size of your plants at the time. Uh, on the other side of the screen is the loose format material, again, with uh, predatory mites. Um, you get tubes, bottles, bags of varying uh, sizes and quantity, um, usually a variation in carrying material for some, uh, whether it be bran or vermiculite, a mixture of both, and in some instances, no carrier material. So those are some of the standards you'll look at for your mites in particular. And with that loose material, some of you may be familiar with uh, Things like this, uh, modified leaf blowers, which can be a very useful tool for applying um, loose mites. A uh, little caveat with that, though, uh, in my experience, you're going to notice a, um, a bit of mortality in putting mites out through these. Yes, it can cover a large surface area with a large quantity of mites, and it will reduce your labor. And it is a relatively efficient way. However, there are instances where your mites are not always going to land on your plants. And again, there's that mortality. So I would say if you do go this route, think about your rates, maybe increase them a little bit. I would also shy away from the idea of putting persimilis through these. I know some growers that do it. Um, again, uh, adjust your rates. You probably want to put out a little bit more if you do go that route for putting out persimilis. Um, but it can be and has been a useful tool um, to put out a large quantity of mites. Continuing on with uh, some of the, the more common release methods that we see. So on the left side of the screen here is the uh, acarline mix, which is a mixture of Encarcia formosa and Aromacerus aromicus, white fly parasitoids. Um, typically you see those uh, in a card format that you can hang in the crop. Um, different sizes, different quantities of um, white fly pupae that are on these cards. Um, on the other side, you have your aphiline, uh, the aphidius colmani, um, aphid parasitoids. Um, so in many cases, you'll see wasps that are packaged in that format where you'll have, uh, you know, some set quantity, 500,000, what have you, in these vials. Okay, so again, um, these are our, our standard stuff, and there are some other options out there that might... Uh, uh, hasten the process with releasing and make things a little bit more efficient. And I'm going to uh, go over those now. So if you're not familiar with some of these, I'm going to go into more detail um, for the next couple slides for these, but I'm um, um, showcasing these uh, alternatives for releasing our, our products. Uh, and these are more, um, more precise and may give you a little bit more speed when uh, you're releasing them. But uh, bug line sachets, uh, persimilis applicators, and these blister packs. Starting with the bug line sachets. Uh, so if you're new to these, um, I know I was new the first time I saw them. Oops, sorry, went ahead of myself there. Um, thought this was a, a totally cool concept when I first started uh, rolling them out in our greenhouse. So basically you're, your typical um, predatory mite sachet, 
but it's in a linear form in a strip. So they're going to come in a case with 600, uh, six spools of 100 meters, just shy of 2,000 linear feet. So for some of the larger growers, you'll have plenty of um, area tables, uh, canopy to put that through. Some of the smaller growers, it might not be applicable for you. It might be too much material. But as you can see from this picture, it lays across very nicely on trellising. And I know in our facility where we were using them, um, we would raise our trellising as the plants got higher and the bug line could just go up with it. As with your typical sachets, you get anywhere between a four to six week window that you'll get some efficacy, which obviously that uh, plays into the environment, uh, more so humidity than anything. But um, it's a nice, easy way to uh, just pull it out through your crop. Um, and these are available for all mites with the exception of persimilis. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video of it being applied, and then I'm going to talk about uh, just some case case uh, case studies of where it actually has saved uh, on labor in the bottom line. So this is a pretty cool video here. It looks like it's a single person pulling out uh, their strip of bug line, and then you can just rip it where you need to for the length. Um, quick and easy, and that's a pretty long structure there. Um, I would imagine trying to hang sachets, uh, every other plant in there would be very time consuming, especially if you don't have any labor. So in the right application, that'll definitely save you some time. Might seem like a lot going on here, but uh, so this was taken from um, the greenhouse that I worked in. Uh, so we had 13 flower houses um, and at least two per week in some cases, we were putting sachets out basically on every other plant. Um, so when I broke down the numbers, it was, if I had two employees going in, it would take us anywhere between two to two and a half hours, depending on the individuals to put out sachets in those houses. And when I broke down the cost for the, the, the year on flipping those houses um, and the total labor involved, it was you know over $7,000 in labor just to put out the sachets per plant. And when we switched over to bug line, not only I reduced the time spent per house, you know, we got down to, you know, I put an hour on there, but anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the individuals putting it out, um, able to reduce my costs by almost four grand, give or take. Uh, yeah, over four grand, actually, I had a 60% labor savings. And uh, I even broke that down further to look at the number of man hours that could be reapplied somewhere else. Um, and almost 160 hours of labor that could be put somewhere else, whether it be putting out some other kind of bugs or doing other, other kind of plant work. So, you know, that was a large, uh, these were large uh, 16,000 square foot greenhouses with, with roughly 4,000 plants per. Um, and, you know, for us, it was a major, a major free up of time. This is another example of a much smaller facility that uh, was an indoor facility, um, not one that I worked in. Uh, one of my coworkers that pieced this together. Um, same number of employees, uh, you know, different pay rate. Of course, that always depends on what region and who you work for. Um, you know, they went from an hour to put out their sachets to what, quarter of an hour to put them out. And when they broke down their labor savings, they were saving almost 10 grand a year. 85%, which is astronomical to me. Uh, I can see why they use this all the time. I mean, it's not for everybody, but if you have the right scenario where you can utilize the material, it can be a serious consideration for um, making your um, sachet applications a little bit more efficient. Touch briefly on these, these persimilis applicators. You may or may not have ever seen these. Um, we produce them, we produce these uh, 2000 persimilis mites in a little vial, and you can get these little screw on caps that help you uh, apply directly to uh, individual plants and even more precisely on individual leaves. Uh, direct applications, getting your persimilis as close as possible to where you need them to knock down those spider mites for you. A little bit cleaner. Okay, a little bit less carry on the material um, and a little less spillage, you know, going everywhere rather than, say, sprinkling bottles out or whatnot. Um, just an option. 
Um, I know a couple growers that I use these uh, on the regular um, and they help them out and get, get the persimilis where they need to. And on the other side of that, now I'm going to talk about my favorite tool really in this whole arsenal is the blister packs. So if you aren't familiar with these, um, and I'm sure maybe many of you have been in a situation where you're in like week five or six and you're way past your spray window and oh, lo and behold, you've got spider mites or maybe even you got some thrips. I don't know. But now you're like, oh, what am I going to do? I don't want to put any loose material out because I don't want to get that vermiculite everywhere. I don't want to ruin the flower, yada, yada, yada. Blisters would be your answer. Um, so inside these blisters, when you're talking about predatory mites, and we can put any species of predatory mites, um, at least foliar mites. So your Swirsky, Cucumeris, uh, Androstoni, Californicus, and Persimilis can all go in these blister packs. So basically you have these little cardboard um, cards with a plastic bubble, which will have a set quantity of mites in there and you can hang that directly on your affected plants open the flap on the back the mites are going to come out they're going to work on those spider mites for you or those thrips or whatever it is you're targeting and then the next day you can come through and you can get rid of that no carrying material on your crop um, super clean easy to put out and already pre-dosed for your mites beautiful beautiful tool especially i think in late flower for any last minute hot spot cleanups that you may need we also package a lot of our parasitoid wasps in these blisters as well which i like that because then again you're getting that pre-portioned uh quantity of wasps makes it easier so you just do the perforation in between the cards and you just spread them out throughout your square footage more evenly and it eliminates that step of having to pour out uh you know um uh, aphid pupae basically in little boxes or you know wherever else um, we also have some of our predators available like feltiella for your uh, spider mite hot spots and um, uh, aphidolides for your uh, aphid hot spots absolutely love the uh, the blisters again real precise uh, and clean application to go in and clean up hot spots now, just to uh, to recap a little bit on those three, which I think uh, in in the right scenario can definitely save you some time, or give you a more efficient placement of your biologicals. Because at the end of the day, it's all about uh, proper placement and proper usage in order for your biological control agents to work correctly. So, you know, look at those those bug lines if you could fit that in there. It might save you on your sachet, sachet usage. Ugh, can't talk. Um, persimilis applicators for that quick burst of persimilis or like I mentioned the blister packs being my personal favorite um, and recapping even further back on that if you want to look at ways you can reduce your labor associated with your biological control program you look again at identifying your needs think prevention first and foremost because that's going to save you in the long run Think about the different growth stages, the pests that you're targeting, and whether it's indoor and outdoor. And I know from my experience, both in the greenhouse and on visiting other greenhouses, everybody does things a little bit differently. I have some growers that don't use any product in veg, whereas I have people that use product um, biological control agents all the way throughout their grow. Think about where your individual needs are, what you need to target, what you need to control, and then think about the different tools that you have um, for the different situations and scenarios that you have and find the right one that fits for you. Because we have many tools available to uh, make things uh, that much more efficient. All right, so I think I went through that fairly quick. Um, <laughs> you could definitely open it up for questions now. Um, All right, I don't see any coming through. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in, please. Okay, it looks like we're clean on, on questions. Uh, thanks a million, Jeff, we appreciate that. That was a great, great informative presentation. And just to close things out a little bit, just a, a brief Griffin commercial for you. Um, about the CEA division, we have 15 warehouses, nationwide footprint. So wherever you may be uh, out there, we have a warehouse uh, near you. We're independently owned company, uh, family owned, actually. Uh, we provide reliable service, 
and we're focused on a collaborative success. So we really believe that we're only as successful as our customers. And we, we strive to make sure that's, that's how we do business. So we appreciate everybody's uh, attention today. Hope it was informative. You will get a link to a recording of this uh, session in case you'd like to share this with anybody else in, on your team. Again, thank you very much for attending and uh, everyone have a, a great rest Excuse of your me. day. I'm oh. sorry. We did have a question that came in by oh, Eric. Okay, Jackson. sure. Go ahead. Nan. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in New Jersey, we see a heavy pressure of corn earworms. What BCA and delivery method would you suggest? I'm not sure. Okay, so oh, he's still there. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was actually getting ready to uh, type in an answer because I checked it when I saw it come up. Um, so I think early before your earworms are showing up, you could definitely employ um, uh, trichogramma, which is a parasitoid wasp that'll target the egg stage of um, your earworms. Um, and then you could also use uh, lace wings when you start to see the little caterpillars. So it becomes a matter of timing. Um, you can get the trichogramma out uh, fairly early. We have a couple different formats that we have. So depending on the size of your grow area, um, we have these little capsules, but they're generally for larger acreage. Um, they were initially designed for drone release, but we also have these little cards that can be hung throughout your crop. And you just want to get them out there probably uh, at least two weeks before you expect those earworms to show up. Um, and then start thinking about uh, maybe getting some lace wings out there to handle any of the larvae that do escape. I don't know if you have uh, the capacity to, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw this in there, even though it's not a macro uh, a biological control agent, but uh, don't be afraid if you can use BT. It works really good for um, the uh, young caterpillar stages when they're feeding, if that's something you incorporate. And they do play nicely with the trichogramma. Oh boy, cannabis aphids. Man, I was battling those on my way out of our last facility. So, um, so there's a couple options you can go here for your cannabis aphids. If, if, uh, if you're not employing parasitoid wasps to catch them early, I mean, if you already have them going on, they will help to some degree, but uh, I always have growers, I always tell growers when they're getting started and if they're gonna, you're gonna have to worry about cannabis aphids at some time. You need to have a combination of wasps going on, uh, Colmani and um, at least the Irvi that we produce. Um, there might be another species out there that uh, will help with that but you need a wasp that's going to target larger aphids um, and then I've uh, lace wings are usually a pretty good go-to and there's also you can get um, we produce the Adalia ladybug in the larval stage that from what I've observed and what I've heard from some other growers is really efficient at uh, munching up the cannabis aphids um, both both options between the lace wings and the uh, the Adalia labor beetle larvae are good at munching munching those aphids up and helping them get them under control. Hey Jeff, there was a question above that. Um, do you guys feel how do you feel about the Tanagar WP twenty two? Yeah, I do see that one. Um, so I used it. Oh, I used a similar product. I'm a huge fan of entomopathogenic fungus, whether it be uh, Bovaria or Isaria. Um, so I think it has its place um, with a good biological control program. It usually plays pretty well. It becomes a matter of timing, though. Um, but yeah, I'm, I feel comfortable with uh, using that product. Uh, the next one from Eric Axelson. Yep, thanks. BT and uh, yep, thanks. BTS and WAS did help. Perfect. Anything else? I think that's it. That's that's all I see. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the questions and uh, your attention today. Hopefully you found everything very informative from the two presentations. And again, if you'd like to, uh, you'll get a link to the recording 
So feel free to share that uh, with anybody else on your team that would benefit from the information today that uh, missed the call. And thank you to everybody and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you.